Hello and welcome everyone to today's webinar that will take us into space as we will uh, talk about the challenges and opportunities brought by the new LEO satellite constellations. So before we get started, here are some uh, practical information. So first, today's webinar is recorded. You will have access to the recording. You can also find the presentation and some documentation in the uh, documents tab. You are also very welcome to submit your questions in the questions tab. We will make sure to take them uh, during the Q&A session. And if we don't have time, we will uh, answer to you afterwards by email. Uh, finally, at the end of the webinar, a short survey will be launched so you can give us your feedback and help us improve future events. Uh, you'll also be doing a good action as for each feedback we receive, we will plan to tree. So uh, today with us, we have two great speakers that I'm very happy to introduce. First, we have uh, Alexandra from Ecuador. Uh, she follows telecoms and spectrum regulation in the Americas. And before joining us, she worked with Vodafone Turkey and the Ecuadorian regulator Arcotel. We also have the pleasure of having Ali joining us from the UK on a very special day. Please uh, join me in wishing a happy birthday to Ali. Uh, Ali follows telecoms regulation in the MENA region, and before joining Colon International, he previously worked for the regulator in Jordan, the regulator in Qatar, but also for operators for Zain and uh, Etisalat. So, uh, what is left to say? Commencing countdown, engines on, check ignition, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Sarah. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. And thanks also to the more than 200 participants who will be connecting with us in this webinar. First of all, for those who don't know us at Kylan International, we provide timely information on regulation regarding different telecommunication sector developments in several countries around the globe in a neutral way. Our aim is to help national authorities, international organizations, private companies, to see the bigger picture behind regulation and competition. Our services cover a wide variety of topics, such as telecommunications, spectrum, media, digital economy, postal services, competition law, and also uh, our Global Trends Services that was launched uh, last year, which covers and gives the overview of uh, developments around the globe in the hot topics global trends so um welcome and i also next one please uh, we have more than 35 years of experience and cover 70 countries in four continents our team is made up of more than 70 experts speaking 26 languages so we make sure we understand most of you uh, to provide services to almost 300 clients in 90 different countries. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us, as I said. And without further preamble, I uh, want to start to dive in in the topic that will, uh, we will assess this morning, connectivity in the LEO satellite constellations era. We can go to the agenda. Uh, to analyze this topic, uh, we would like to briefly discuss four key topics. One, the evolution of satellite communications with general information. Two, an overview of current LEO constellation projects and their business model. Uh, third, Ali and I will try to cover the status of the regulatory framework in different parts of the globe, which is our um, core business at Canon. And in the end, we will address several challenges and opportunity in the industry. So please, um, let's welcome Ali, who will explain us the first part of this webinar. Thank you, Alexandra. Thank you. Thank you for the nice introduction. And it's indeed, indeed, it's a huge evolution in the satellite industry. Manufacturing and launching new satellites is more affordable and rapid than ever. Next, please. <clears throat> Next. Okay. So, so what's happening in space? So we launched 
satellite, more satellite than ever before. In the last two years only, the number of satellite objects launched was much higher than the total number of satellites that have been launched since 1957, when the first satellite was put into space. The number of active satellites surged from around 1,000 in 2013 to more than 6,500 by October 2022. This trend is expected to accelerate in the coming years with more satellites are planned to be launched. We may reach up to 50,000 active satellites in the next decade if this trend continues to grow. <clears throat> The main reason of this acceleration is the ongoing launch of series of large constellation of satellites to provide fiber-like communication services, as we'll see later in this webinar. But you know, with a great opportunity, with a great opportunities comes great challenges. Here in this webinar, we'll talk about uh, the opportunities that this Leo constellation will bring to, to the telecom industry, and also about the challenges of the increased number of satellites in the space. Next, please. So what is satellite? Uh, the simple definition of the satellite that it's a man-made object placed in a space orbit in the outer space. When the satellite is placed in its orbit and it's given initial power to move, it continue, continue moving in that orbit forever without the need for artificial power to move. When a satellite in its orbit, it has a perfect balance between its momentum and the Earth gravity. Okay. Now, what's the outer space? Outer space, you know, which we normally refer to it as a space. So when we say space, it's the same as outer space. Uh, the simple definition of the outer space, it is the empty area beyond our Earth atmosphere where orbital forces exceed aerodynamic forces. Outer space is a vacuum, which means there is no, no resistance forces and hence the objects in space are in continuous movement. But where does the outer space start? There is no agreed international definition for the outer space or its boundary. However, many organizations and countries adopted Carmel Line, which is an 100 meter above uh, the sea level, uh, which is an imaginary line set by a scientist called Theodore Carmen in an attempt to define a boundary between Earth atmosphere and outer space. Some organization, this is the most common 100, but some of them they they saying it's 80 kilometers, some, but the most common is 100 kilometers, the Carmel line. Next, please. Now, how it works, how does the satellite works? Satellite works like a space bridge between two points on Earth. It receives the signal from the Earth, change the frequency, amplify the signal, and send it back to Earth. In a simple definition, it's like a space or repeater, a space mirror or repeater for the telecommunication signal. Satellite consists of two main segments, which is the space segment and the Earth segment. The satellite in the space represent the space segment, and on the ground, we have the Earth station uh, and the uh, end user terminal. So the end user terminal can be your normal mobile phone, as we'll see, like by Apple 14, iPhone 14. It can be a small sensor for an IoT system on a gas pipe in the middle of a desert, very small or a dish antenna on top of your house, or a special antenna on an airplane, in the sky, on, or on a boat in the ocean. So many types of antennas are and devices. The size and complexity of these receiving, of the, of the, of the receiving device depends on the operational mode of the receiver, the complexity of the system, the type of the service, the frequencies, there are so many factors. But like, you know, people, tend to think of satellite, you know, is, is always a dish or something big, it can be something very small. Now the ground station, ground station works as a main hub for connecting the satellite system to the internet. Ground station normally consists of the monitoring and control system of the constellation, which almost has to monitor the constellation. Luckily, you know, which is recently announced by uh, Starlink, that the, the next generation of satellite will support laser communication, where two satellites can talk to each other and create a mesh network in the space, which means more efficient system with less number of uh, ground station, more system capacity, and even faster internet speed. Next, please. Satellites are classified by orbits. 
scientists defined several types of orbits. But for telecommunication services, we are mainly concerned by three main orbits, which is, let's start with the first one, geostationary Earth orbit, which is almost 36,000 kilometers above Earth. It must always orbit the satellite there. It must always orbit uh, along the equator. You need three equal space satellites to have a global coverage. This is because when the satellite is far from the Earth, it can cover large section at once. Satellites in LEO have the same speed as Earth, and hence the orbital speed of these satellites is exactly as the orbital speed period of the Earth, moves three kilometers per second. The little one which is moving here, like electron, um, which is the LEO. So I'll jump from uh, GEO to LEO. On the other hand, LEO, uh, as the name suggests, it's closer, relatively close to the Earth. It normally at an altitude between 160 to 2,000 kilometers above Earth. I like, I like satellites in GEO, satellites in LEO moves in a much faster speed than the Earth. Depending on the satellite, every satellite will take between 17 to 88, um, yeah, below, below two, two hours to, to have a complete orbit around the Earth. As a way of compromising orbit, if you see, if one satellite, if one satellite in LEO is at 400 kilometer, that means it's 90 times closer to the Earth than, the, than a satellite in GEO. The third one is medium Earth orbit, which compromise a wide range of orbits, anywhere between LEO and, and GEO. But the common use, the, the commonly used orbit is between 2,000 and 20,000 kilometer, it's similar to you, LEO, as the satellites are non-geostationary satellite and keeps moving in higher speed more than the speed of the Earth. It's very common to be used for, G, for uh, satellite navigation satellite system. So it's used for GPS system and European radio navigation system. Uh, next, yeah. So this shows like the distribution of active satellite uh, of the orbits. 88% of active satellite are in LEO and only 9% of active satellite in GEO and the remaining 3% are distributed between MEO and other orbits. As we said, we have there are other orbits, but we, we didn't mention it here. Okay, so now to have you a comparison between different satellite orbits. Next. Okay, so geo satellites are typically the size of a bus and very expensive to build and launch. So you see the cost per satellite is around between 100 to 400 million to, to build and launch. They have a big advantage that the global coverage can be provided with a few satellites. However, these systems have a significant challenge, which is the latency. The signal takes long time to travel to 336,000 kilometers from air to the, to the satellite in that orbit and come back. Latency in, in GEO are typically over 600 milliseconds. If you see like many modern service applications, including real time, video communication, gaming, e-sport, financial trading, metaverse, it's all require um, uh, internet connectivity with latency below 200 milliseconds. It's very difficult to attend and be active in such webinar that we are using right now if you are using internet connection that has a latency more than 200 milliseconds. In MEO, the size, the cost, and the characteristics of the system depends on the altitude of the constellation. So if you are operating, let's say, about let's say 6,000 kilometers, or four, you are close uh, to the to the LEO, which makes it like more similar to the LEO. That means you need more number of satellites, more earth station, lower latency. If you go higher, like let's say 20 kilometers, then you are close to the geo. On the other hand, the LEO, the third one. Okay. So the LEO satellite system provides low latency, high speed internet connection. As the satellite, as we said, it's orbit close to the earth and the signal takes much less time to travel between Earth and the satellite compared to the to GEO. However, the satellite in LEO moves very fast and they are only visible from the ground for a short period of time. Let's say typically less than two hours. It to require less than two hours to have a full orbital cycle. Because of this, we need hundreds and thousands of satellites to have a global coverage. 
as well as we need a huge number of ground stations that can track these satellites and provide the backbone connectivity. Next, please. Okay. So this is a comparison between the satellite, the performance of satellite internet uh, coming from satellite compared to uh, fixed broadband in US. I'm choosing this to show you the difference between, because it has the uh, Starlink, which is a satellite in LEO, and Usenet and Biosat are in GEO. Starlink, uh, Starlink is the only satellite, uh, it was the only satellite because, you know, there are some something happening in, in 2020, but this is from 2021. So Starlink was the only satellite internet provider with a median latency that anywhere near the median latency on fixed. So it's below than 50 millisecond. Uh, while in, in, in uh, both in, in GEO, it's above 600 millisecond. These results are from 22. So the result in 2022, this is from 2021. The new results, I didn't show it because it's very complex. Uh, it shows that the median download speed, uh, download speed in US dropped to 62 milli, uh, megabit per second from 97. And the median upload speed dropped from 90.3 to 7.2. But the latency, the good news is that the latency is still, still below 50 milliseconds, which is around 48 milliseconds. Um, this will be also discussed later in the challenges that, you know, because when you have more customers, the demand is increasing, there are new challenges to the Leo satellite constellation, which drive like the performance sometimes to go down, you know. So this also will be discussed later in the challenges. Now we'll go to the Leo constellation projects. Uh, my colleague Alexandra will take you through the different type of uh, active satellite uh, EU constellation. The right, floor is yours, Alexandra. Thank you, Ali. Thank you for this introduction to satellite services and their evolution, which is really important. Um, over the past years, there's been a lot of discussion regarding LEO constellations. As, uh, as Ali just explained, LEO satellites follow low Earth orbits, Essentially, we see around the Earth like electrons, right? Being much closer to the Earth than traditional geo satellites and work together to ensure a full coverage of the Earth, including polar regions, for, for example, that geo networks can't. Leo connectivity is a proven concept. This is something that is clear for, for all of us. Satellite communications provider Iridium has been using them since the 90s and is still active. But before going further, what is this renewed interest in LEO? If this has existed since the 90s, why the industry is now focusing on these uh, LEO satellites? And well, the answer um, is that basically market dynamics and around supply and, the, and demand have changed. And you can see this in the slide we are showing now. Cisco's latest report shows that tremendous increase in data traffic and internet users, devices and connections have increased in 50% uh, more than uh, from uh, 2019. Mobile operators can satisfy this demand alone, right? However, it's not only the current connectivity, uh, the connected population of which demand has increased, which drives the interest to satellite services but also the unconnected areas worldwide, which terrestrial services can't reach. Satellite services are known for being a tool which is uh, usually used by governments to shorten the digital divide. As a result, what we are seeing is a significant increase in the investment being made by different actors, not only in the private sector, but also by governments. Also, this has enabled satellite manufacturers to produce smaller and more powerful satellites which the correspond, with the corresponding decrease in the cost. The cost of, of launch has decreased even to under $2,000 uh, $2, per kilogram, something that was in something surprising for most of us and it wouldn't have been thought possible a few years ago. So as I'm sure you already know, 
most key elements of the Leo business case are on the cost side, the cost of satellites uh, it themselves, uh, the cost of the launch, ground stations and user terminals are determinant for their success. These elements are of course interrelated with additional factors such as spectrum assets, performance metrics, quality of service, and of course, regulation. Next one, please. So who are the key players in this new part of the satellite industry? We will start by, the, uh, by SpaceX, a satellite service operator, which is present in 40 countries so far, SpaceX, has announced their plans for initial constellation of approximately 12,000 to 42,000 satellites. Uh, their strategy is a go-to market. They try to capture different segments of the satellite communication markets in the retail and wholesale markets. The company is now developing disruptive services for mobile users, such as consumers in cars, uh, trucks, ships, and airplanes. Next one, please. This is a start. Uh, next one is Amazon Project Kuiper. As well as Starlink, Amazon wants to address the end consumer. It recently announced one of the biggest deals in the commercial space history, industry history, signing on with three companies to launch its internet satellites. The Kuiper constellation is planned to consist of uh, more than 3,000 satellites which they are expecting to take a decade to deploy fully, or at least they plan to deploy half of it until 2026, according to their FCC license. Telesat, on the other hand, the next one, please. Telesat, on the other hand, with the light speed, um, is also firmly in play even if it's at a, at a lower scale than the former two. It downsized the expected amount of satellites for its mega constellation and has now set a plan to launch a total of 188, almost 200 LEO satellites. Opposed to the previous uh, two mentioned satellite providers, the LESAT approach is to build an enterprise-grade network. Another key player, next one please, is OneWeb whose journey to provide satellite services hasn't been as smooth as you, I'm sure you already know, with launch delays, bankruptcy from which it, it was uh, saved by different investors, OneWeb Constellation is now expected to be completed by the first month of next year. And as of today, OneWeb has more or less under 500 opera operational satellites in orbit and will look to bring this tally up 650 more or less. Like Starlink, OneWeb is taking a corporate B2B approach. Some other projects in other parts, next one please. Uh, in other parts of the world, we have additional research covering Australia, India, Japan, South Africa, Arabia, and other parts of the world. But I just wanted to mention, next one please, um, Go One, which is an example of another proposed constellation in China. Next one, please. Now, it's important to understand the value chain of the industry. In upstream markets, companies offer manufacturing and launch services, while in downstream markets, there are ground technology and software providers, as well as two types of satellite service providers, non-terrestrial, for example, Imarsat or CES, and terrestrial providers like uh, AT&T or Telstra that offer satellite-based services to end consumers. Some of the actors in the satellite value chain operate in more than one market segment, and an example of this is SpaceX, which is operating in both upstream and downstream, downstream markets, as we have just said. Next one, please. And then and the next slide is briefly showing the interaction between several actors, several players, uh, which are being uh, called to work together in these LEO constellation projects. We have major inter internet and cloud providers, large scale technology players, venture capital backed startups, and governments or uh, public institutions which are investing also in the uh, industry. But what we also have is 
the combination of other satellite service providers which are operating in other uh, orbits like GEO or MEO. Next one, please. Which take us to, to analyze two important things. The first one, which is the relation of these satellite operators with other telcos. Starlink and Amazon Kuiper can be seen as competition in retail market for mobile services. On the contrary, for example, OneWeb could be seen as complements because they are working in the B2B market, as we just said, and they interact with telcos signing agreements, um, distribution agreements, for example, and also they interact with verticals like airlines and ships. These partnerships are usually aimed at increasing uh, and using potential uh, potentiating the synergies between the businesses. In the case of the interaction with telcos, these partnerships uh, aim at increasing mobile operators' capacity to serve with high capacity and low latency in remote areas. And also, LEO satellite um, can provide backhaul connectivity and support migration from 4G to 5G, and even we are talking about 6G lately. One example is uh, OneWeb with uh, their relation with Barty Airtel, uh, which offers mutual benefits. Airtel parent company is India's largest integrated telecom provider and one of the largest mobile operators in Africa. So it helps uh, the operator and also helps OneWeb to go and to strengthen their position in the different markets. Next one, please. And the second thing, we, we, we are going to analyze uh, in this interrelation is the collaborative behind that collaborative agreements with other connectivity service uh, services they are also um, mergers and acquisitions going on in these last few months an example is in july this year the french satellite operator eutelsat reached an agreement to merge with OneWeb aiming to strengthen their position. Well, the deal still uh, requires regulatory approval, but it is important how uh, these two uh, service providers are interacting. And this is not an isolated case. A proposed merger between satellite companies in Marsat and Biasat is also currently under review by authorities in the, in the EU and the UK. Says and Intelsat are also reportedly discussing a potential merger. Both Imarsat and Biasat currently operate geosatellites. On the other hand, Says is currently engaged in deploying O3B, a fleet of MEO satellites, to offer broadband services to uncovered populations around the world. And in, in this context of global alliances and revamped ambition in the satellite industry, new policies debate are also starting to emerge and something that is really important is how or the status of the regulatory framework around the world so for this let's welcome again Ali who will give us an overview of which regulation is in place in this industry Ali? thank you thank you Alexandra Okay. So now, next, yeah, okay, this one. So reg space regulation is still a gray area. There are no agency who approves or reject launching any object into space. However, there are three main principles govern the space activities. The first one, no, no, can you go back to the international level? Okay. So the first one is the uh, is based on the United Nations Outer Space Treaty in 1957 that space is free for exploration and use. And the second one is the responsibility, which depicts that each country is responsible for its own satellite. And the third one is liability, which states that each state shall be liable for any damages caused by its space object. However, still, you know, international space doesn't define what is an object, what do we mean by an object, how, you know, the size of the object, or what is an outer space, as we said before. So, uh, since satellite can transmit across national borders over multiple 
individual states. So their use of spectrum need to be managed globally. So spectrum currently, uh, co spectrum coordination overseen by International Telecommunication Union, which is also a specialized uh, agency under the United Nations. ITU is responsible for also for management of parking lots, satellite parking lots in GEO. We call it parking lots as the satellite in LEO, in GEO stays in constant position relevant to any object on Earth. However, there is no international entity currently assigns or regulate orbital slots for LEO satellite and other non-geostationary satellites. Next, please. Okay, on a national level, regulators are licensing the Earth station. Can you press next? On a national, regulators are licensing Earth station and the spectrum as well as the terminal equipment. Regulators are also involved in processing of satellite filing to ITU, which enable the satellite operator to gain the international recognized spectrum and orbital resources superior to the deployment of a planned satellite system. LEO, of a satellite, LEO system operates, operators apply for spectrum allocation from the national regulator in the country in which they wish to operate. And they specify the type of orbits and the application uh, and the service they wanted to provide. As LEO Earth orbits are essentially on first come first serve base, their basis, there's no fees for occupying uh, the orbits. So regulators are also involved in mitigating and uh, resolving internet issues between spectrum users and also coexistence between service services between na fixed mobile on a national level so now is the time to show you a bit what we are expert at at talent our benchmarks on regulation this is our our core in, in Cali. In this case, we will describe for you some of the recent and important developments in last year and months regarding regulation and policy initiatives in the satellite market of different regions, such as the Americas, Europe, MENA countries, and an overview of a couple uh, more parts of the rest of the world. Remember that if you are subscribed to our services, you can access to our specific reports. And while this has been also motivated by, by our Global Trends Service, which, as I said, analyzes these key topics in, uh, under a global perspective view. Well, and as I am part of the Americas team, I will start describing a bit our region. In the Americas, a continent of vast remote areas, as you know, with low connectivity, uh, last, thank you, with low connectivity, the focus is now placed on the role of LEO satellite services since SpaceX services are already available in several countries. In North America, the United States is working at different levels to promote the deployment of satellite technology. The US private sector also, eh, including some relevant startups, have taken the lead in, passion, in pushing investment and innovation in the sector. In Canada, on the other side, uh, though SpaceX is commercially available in several areas, the market is based on public investment, where the Canadian government has um, is leading two main initiatives, Telesat Leo and Spare, Space Bridge. In Latin America, only Chile and Brazil have commercial availability with other countries planned for 2022 by the end of the year and uh, next year, 2023. In Central America, only Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico have satellite services commercially available right now. Regarding the regulatory developments, in the US, the FCC proposed updated rules for spectrum sharing among non-stationary fixed satellite service systems to facilitate the deployment of new generation LEO satellite systems and ease somehow the obstacles for new operators to enter into this market. Other initiatives in the country seek to foster next generation space and satellite technologies and improve space safety. Uh, for example, space deorbiting and sustainability. And here, a short comment 
uh, the orbiting a satellite, which means after the satellite has finished his job, has to go back to Earth. For this, before in the US, they could take 25 years, but now the time has been shortened to only five years, which need some spectrum traffic management, some space traffic management, which we will address a bit later in, in this webinar. On the other side, Colombia, Latin America, um, also set new rules last February, uh, also set new rules on licenses and spectrum fees for satellite services. Now, spectrum fees will no longer be linked to the broadband bandwidth offered. Um, under the previous system, satellite operators who wanted to increase bandwidth capacity risked facing higher costs. In Brazil, on the other hand, Anatel reviewed the rules to grant licenses to provide satellite services on a first to come first base, serve basis and authorized company to replace satellites in a constellation without a specific license. But now Ali will tell more about uh, MENA countries. So in MENA also, we, it's, it's, uh, we have a vast remote areas with low connectivity. We are not far away from Americas. Uh, satellite services are available in in the region, in all the region, uh, but not not from Leo, from Leo constellation. Leo constellation is slow coming for for the region, you know. So uh, SpaceX now till now is licensed only in Bahrain and Qatar, and they did a trial uh, in Jordan. They didn't announce like if they have an issue or, or if they have applied like they're waiting for a license the regulatory development in other countries but on their website they're saying you know it's uh, coming in, in in the next year on the other hand you know uh, we we saw OneWeb is very active in the region so they established um, an investment fund with uh, another investor in Saudi Arabia to distribute the service across the the, the region and Africa and they got a license also to operate in, in Saudi Arabia. In Oman also, they, they have entered into a distribution agreement with another operator to support uh, the, uh, the mobile operator. So their main business, as Elena said, they're not consumer, but they're targeting business to business. eSpace, it's, it's a new uh, space, uh, new space constellation. Also, they announced they have been registered in Saudi Arabia to provide the service. This is something new, um, but they didn't announce like when they will start providing the service. Um, and, and the reason, like, I want to highlight about Saudi Arabia because they have been very active, very active in terms of space activities and other non-terrestrial uh, non -terrestrial services. So the regulator of Saudi Arabia is now responsible for managing the regulatory activities related to the space sector which was previously the responsibility of the space, uh, Saudi Space Commission. Now, the, the, even the name changes from Communication and um, Information Technology to Communication and Space Commission. And there is also a new law under consultation until uh, mid of December, beginning of December. And just yesterday, the, the auction started for uh, a spectrum in 2.1 gigahertz for um, mobile satellite service and air to ground services. And four uh, applications were qualified to participate, including some of them, you know, Iridium. They have a partnership with, uh, with another company in Saudi Arabia. Uh, uh, Omnispace also, they are participating and other big names are participating in, in, this, uh, in this spectrum auction. Um, the, the result will, will, will be announced uh, mid, of, mid of December. Uh, and now the, the remaining of my, my colleague Alexandra will talk about selected countries around the globe because we don't have time you know, to cover all the globe. But as Alexandra said, uh, our, we have a benchmark. We have several benchmarks, but one of them is talking about satellite development across the globe. And some of them are uh, EU, Australia, and India which my colleagues Alexandra will cover. Thank you so much, Ali. Yes, uh, we want uh, to give you just a small candy of what we do at Kalen. So we will show you just a specific parts of our benchmarks. Um, in the EU, 
a couple of weeks ago, the Council and the European Parliament reached an agreement, uh, reached a provisional agreement on a regulation establishing the EU's Secure Connectivity Program for the period 2023-2027. Uh, the program sets goals for the European Union to deploy a satellite constellation called IRIS, uh, which stands for Infrastructure for Resilience, Interconnectivity and Security by Satellite, which will enable secure communication services by 2027. In India, another area we cover, in September this year, the government of India's department, uh, sorry, the India's Department of Telecommunications released a draft of the Indian Telecommunication Bill uh, for public consultation. The bill aims to create a comprehensive and contemporary framework for the regulation of telecommunications in the country and expands several legal definitions, including uh, that of a telecommunication cell service which also now includes uh, satellite services. And also uh, presents a number of onerous regulatory requirements for internet-based satellite providers and users alike. In Australia, uh, the regulator published the Spectrum Outlook for 2022 20, until 27, and here they acknowledge the need for new regulatory arrangements for non-geostationary orbit uh, services, and they are also planning to allocate the spectrum in the 2 gigahertz, the 3.5 gigahertz, and, the, and some microwave bands as the 40 and 40 gigahertz bands, 47 gigahertz bands. So this is more or less an overview of other parts of the world, but with more satellites in, in the space come also new opportunities, as we've been saying, and new business cases, but also new challenges, which Ali is going to, to talk about. Th thank you, Alexandra. So with the huge, we have a huge opportunities and the opportunities are everywhere. So the hunger for faster internet speed, more capacity and lower latency at an affordable price everywhere is increasing. The demand is hugely increasing. Let's not forget like there are still 2.9 billion people, which is around like 40% of the world population, still don't have access to the internet. So the opportunity is there for more, more uh, the need for faster internet, more capacity, lower latency, everywhere is there and it's increasing. And it's still like half, almost half of the world's population is still unconnected. So the, the opportunity is really huge. Next, please. So the solution, the solution is not terrestrial networks only. It's not satellite only. It's not fixed uh, fiber or cover only. The solution is all. The solution is a hybrid system where there is full interoperability and compatibility between different access technology. This is from 3GBB where the latest standard of 3GBB has enabled 5G system to support almost any type of network that involve non-terrestrial flying objects. Non-terrestrial flying objects, uh, non-terrestrial networks family includes all kinds of satellite communication, geo, leo, MIO, and high altitude platforms, uh, any terrestrial IMT base station, they call it sometimes tower in the sky, and air to ground uh, networks to support network to, to the aircrafts. We are moving from coexistence between terrestrial service, fixed and mobile, and satellite service to unification of standards. 6G is envisaged to have full interoperability standards between terrestrial and non-terrestrial networks, where the user won't feel if they will, will the user won't feel if the phone is using a satellite network or a mobile network. Next, please. With iPhone 14 now, you can use emergency communication via satellite to text emergency services messages when you are out. Uh, when you are we are not in coverage of Wi-Fi or cellular coverage, you can also you you need what you need to do. You need find find my app to and share it to the to the satellite. 
there are so many challenges with this with this technology including the cost of building and launching uh, satellites the speed at which the you know the, these uh, satellite orbits and how you need to track it with your phone you know there it's very complex but you know it although like, there are so many limitations but it has also the potential to in the dead zone where it has been very expensive and very difficult for mobile operators to cover the current system the expectation that there will be a number of players, a number of applications creating new economics over the satellite industry. Mega satellite constellation Leo will provide a global coverage, complemented by satellites in MIO and GEO and other terrestrial networks. Next, please. But the future is not without risk. Can you go back? Okay, so the future is not without risk. With this a huge number of satellites, whether active or abundant, there is a potential for large amount of satellite debris. I just took this satellite, you know, to show how, you know, the, 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 the problem, how huge is it. Both planned and unplanned uh, satellite risk everything. The debris could physically damage other internet access system in lower Earth or orbit. They can cause interference or present danger to people in space or on Earth. Regulation and standard are lacking, which implies, implies uncertainty for existing as well as new players. The good news, as uh, Alexandra said, you know, that it's, it's changing. You know, recently FCC in USA mandated LEO satellite to deorbit their satellite within five years of ending operation. And also in new and there is a new guidelines the on mitigating this the space debris next please the second big challenge is equitable access to everyone which is sustainability so uh, is there a space left in space it's a trivial question yes uh, space is infinite but the space orbits are finite resources as we said like uh, there are itus managing parking lots in geo but nobody no organization uh, managing the space launch or the non-geostationary orbits. These are, there are some countries owns more satellite than others. United States, for example, owns more than 62% of active satellite currently on, in space. Um, and, you know, uh, China, Russia, and uh, USA altogether more, owns more than three quarter of the satellite. And uh, the rest of the world have less than quarter. 87% uh, of USA satellites are for commercial purposes and the remaining for government, military, and, you know, scientific studies. This poses a critical question to the, on the equitable access for all. So on, on, this is the, the need to be managed some way uh, with the, the, they call it a space traffic management. My colleague Alexandra will talk about it. Yes, Ali, and it, it's true. It is, next one, please. Uh, it is complex. Several constellations of thousands of satellites create new challenges. More ground stations are needed to communicate with a large volume of satellites, and careful management is required to avoid interference. For the long term and sustainable development of space activities, it's no longer sufficient to know the location of spacecrafts uh, or try to only address the space debris. Instead, it is imperative uh, to have a common understanding in management of our maneuver in a congested environment. But next one, please. For We are approaching the end of this webinar um, for making a summary of the specific challenges that uh, new constellation, new satellite services are Facing, we can see that uh, they are fighting uh, in different areas, and as well as the industry grows, and new opportunities are presented, challenges can't wait. First of all, satellite companies need to take advantage of technology evolution to meet market needs at private and also public level. It is important for operators to take into account not only the supply side, but also the demand side. 
provide uh, the services and also the terminals for users as well as to foster digital literacy to help people to understand the benefits of this technology and make the most of its use. Take advantage of the synergies that could be created in the interrelation with other actors as we have just analyzed to promote creative and disruptive business models which can fairly compete in the market with other services. The challenge for those operators who want to address the end consumer is not uh, one of coverage specifically, but rather pricing, specifically that of consumer premises equipment and distribution. Here also, since the industry requires a la large amount of capex, as you already know, there is always a risk and we've seen experiences of funding drying out. On the regulatory side, a long-term legal and regulatory certainty would be ideal for everyone. But this is also a challenge for regulators and for governments in general. A streamlined and predictable licensing processes with reasonable fees. We have several options here for, uh, for regulators like open skies, uh, an open skies policy or blanket licensing, the establishment of reasonable license term, as well as technology neutrality. And regarding the provision of services, as just uh, as Ali just explained, orbital and spectrum availability is the main source needed, resource needed. So orbital and spectrum allocation, as well as spectrum harmonization and relocation of other services, which could be using a specific bands that now are going to be used by satellites, needs to be seriously analyzed by regulators and by international organizations. And before finishing, um, Ali, I would like you to, to tell us which are the main takeaways from all this research. Thank you, thank you, Alexandra. So the main takeaway here is that big challenges require many solutions. The only right answer is a mix of technology. It's not one technology, it's a mix of technology. Satellite is an integral part of today's and tomorrow's digital ecosystem, including 5G. New dynamics are evolving in the satellite industry. We have seen like hundreds of new technology startups, partnership, of different market players and several business cases are emerging. For policymaker, it's the big challenge will be making uh, a space sustainable for all and to create a technology inclusive regulatory framework for all access technologies and remove any artificial restriction and encourage cooperation between all the players. So I hope we didn't talk, uh, we, we have six minutes left for for the q and a uh, we'll try to answer by the way if if we didn't answer this question the all the received the question will be answered by by email later you know we'll try to answer some of the question here sarah do we have a question yeah uh, ali alexandra th thank you for for this presentation so we have a uh, first question so what about the debate about some satellite players arguing that their services can directly compete with mobile operators, especially to connect underserved areas using government subsidies? I don't know which one of you wants to answer that. Yeah. I can take the, the question. Thank you. Uh, well, the response is not easy. It's a hot debate, but current Policymakers' uh, approaches are varied, are varied, are different. For example, the Brazilian Minister of Telecommunications reportedly said that Starlink is expected to participate in an option to subsidize the connectivity of schools. We will see how it changes with uh, the new government. But in the US, for example, the FCC recently rejected broadband subsidies, which were worth around uh, 2 billion for SpaceX, uh, claiming that the U.S. government can't afford, and, and I quote, can't afford to subsidize ventures that are not delivering, delivering the promised fits or are not likely to meet program requirements. So it is a hot debate. The approaches are varied. Uh, we will see how it ends up uh, being managed by different governments. Okay, so... 
maybe another question here. Uh, is there any national security concerns with uh, these satellite constellations? I'll, I'll take this one. So uh, the, the, there's no yes or no here, but it depends on, on the type of service also. And um, the licensing regime in that country. So imagine like Starlink want to provide a service in any country, they will go to that country and they will ask for a license with our, like in, in European Union, there is no requirement for a service license, but there is a spectrum license. And that, in that license, you may list down like your, uh, let's say your requirement, national requirement. In, in some part of the country, uh, of the world, they are asking, we have seen it in MENA, there are some delay in giving a license to such constellation because there are some requirements related to, let's say, you know, having uh, the database, and you know monitoring the calls uh, within that country but you know satellite operators they always saying you know we have a solution for that one so there is no need to create uh, an earth station or um, uh, an operation center in each country because it will be costly and you know at the end of the day they cannot do it they cannot have operation across the globe but you know they have a solution they have something called mirroring you know the traffic and the, can uh, they, they have a solution for call intercept so hopefully hopefully there is no no threat and you know and as elena said you know the regulatory regime is evolving and and uh, the requirement i hope they, they will meet in, in uh, somewhere you know so uh, maybe um well we, we've got some question about uh, who would be uh, responsible for for the regulation so we have the first one so who is responsible for spectrum regulation for mss spectrum is it itu or the country nra and also uh, for satellite solutions that use cellular spectrum uh, which authority would be responsible for spectrum authorization in uh, international waters for instance for for maritime use for instance so in the you know in the space is like a high sea so there is no in the international law still you know there are so many gray areas in in regulating you know satellite communication all activities in in, in high sea in, in ocean but let's say on, on a national level on a national level the spectrum is assigned by the national regulator on an international level there is uh, there is always, you know, which band is for satellite and which band is for fixed, because to, to make it on an international level, make it easier for, for the industry, for the man, manufacturer, for the service provider uh, to know w w in which uh, spectrum they are playing, you know. But on a national level, at the, at the end of the day, it comes to the national regulator to say, you know, no, I don't want fixed here, I want mobile here, and this is the price. So it depends on the priority of the regulator. So if they want this strictly, they want the service, they say, we saw it, uh, let's say, in some, when there is a war, you know, in Ukraine, they, they need the service, so they will not ask, you know, you need to have a license or something like this. So uh, then it depends on the country, on the service, on the, uh, let's say, uh, situation of that country. Okay, uh, we have some uh, other questions, but uh, we are also reaching uh, the end of the time allocated to this webinar. So I don't know, uh, do you want to take another question or should we maybe reply by email? The last one, we, we can take which one? Yeah, okay, just one uh, last one. Uh, we have a question here. Is there any FCC limit for the number of satellites serving a particular area? I think we should check that. To, not, not, not to be mistaken, to, uh, we, we can send you by email. Yeah. There is another question regarding the um, brownfield and greenfield aspect. Uh, here, Sarah. So I, I can I can take this one. Yeah. yeah. Uh, greenfield and brownfield. <laughs> uh, just to remind you that greenfield and brownfield investments are two different types of foreign direct investment. Both involve companies and production facilities in different countries, but um, that's primarily where the similarities between the two end. So in a greenfield investment, the parent company opens a subsidiary in another country. We can see this uh, reflected in the satellite industry very easily. We can see how other companies are, SpaceX is 
uh, one example of how they are opening um, ser uh, providing services in other parts of the world uh, and instead of buying existing facilities in that country the company begins a new venture by constructing new facilities in that country also amazon kuiper project kuiper could be an example sorry and um And in the brown field, uh, we can see also um, companies who uh, don't want to produce or deploy their own infrastructure, but buy other companies or merge with other companies to help them to, to provide these services. So OneWeb could be an example of this kind of investment. So I see uh, the last question is uh, about like, can you share a high level statistics about, just a minute, about about the current use cases of Leo in MENA or worldwide, the majority part, the last mile backhauling verticals. You know, frankly speaking on, like, on this part, like backhauling verticals, we, we, we have seen so many announcements for partnership in the, there is you know i've checked like i was like trying to find some statistics here you know unfortunately it's not yet public publicly available hopefully soon we'll, we'll have some figures you know next year or something okay so uh, i yeah. yeah for the for the other questions we will reply by email i'll let uh, alexandra conclude and uh yeah <laughs> Thank you, thank you so much, Sarah. I didn't want to finish before say, uh, telling you that uh, this uh, satellite service uh, at Kalen is is new. It was launched last year, and we are still researching. So, any contribution, any question you might have that you would like to be covered by our services is more than welcome. And as I said, it's an undergoing process. We like to have timely and current information in every topic we analyze and satellite uh, industry is one of the examples new topics being analyzed by Kalen, new topics uh, we want to cover and uh, we are open to your suggestions and to your questions anytime you can also send us emails you will have the handouts after the the this webinar and anything else thank you so much for joining i hope you have enjoyed and we have provided you with this overview we wanted to, to give you. Yeah, thank, thank you, Alexandra. Thank you, Ali. And uh, I will uh, just uh, jump uh, on what Alexandra said and remind you that there is a feedback survey that will uh, uh, open when you when we close this uh, webinar. And uh, yes, feedback is extremely valuable for us, as Alexandra said. Uh, you will also have the opportunity there to, to suggest some topics for future webinars. So really, uh, go and uh, tell us what you want to hear about we we want to know and uh, yeah thank you ali thank you alexandra yeah, thank you everyone uh, yeah we, we need to remind them like we are sharing also the presentation you know with you yeah. and if you have any question also my contacts and alexandra contacts you can approach us directly or or to come in anytime sure no okay so this concludes the this uh webinar it was uh, super interesting for me at least <laughs> well, uh, thank you thanks a lot and uh, have a nice rest of the day everyone thank you thank you bye bye bye, bye.